we are... Uh, uh, let me preface that I feel like we might be heading into some treacherous water this morning. Um, for the last couple of weeks, we've been taking some time with Timothy. And if you've spent any time in the books of Timothy, in First and Second Timothy, you realize that there are some passages that have been somewhat controversial. And uh, we're going to dig into one of those today. We've, we've kind of cracked the beginning of both letters so far. Last week, we were in Second Timothy. We were looking at... Um, the faith of Timothy, how it first resided uh, in his grandmother Lois and in his mother Eunice. We talked about making your mama proud, uh, fanning into flame the gift of God that is in us. That's kind of in the intro of Second Timothy. The week before, we looked at the intro to First Timothy. And we saw the Apostle Paul writing to his young protege. We looked at the introduction and heard the just compassion in his tone. How he referred to Timothy as his, his beloved son and and in, in that first week, we, we journeyed together looking at what it might look like to encourage someone else to fight the good fight. If we were to sit down and write a letter, you might remember what it would be like to encourage someone to keep the faith. And today, we're going to get into some of the meat of Paul's message because the books are really short and Paul kind of digs right in at the beginning of chapter 2 in 1 Timothy. And for 21st century readers, this isn't always an easy passage to swallow. So we're going to need to chew on it a bit. So bear with me. This might feel a little bit more like a Bible study this morning uh, than uh, necessarily a sermon on Second or 1 Timothy chapter 2. But come with me. We're going to read the whole chapter. It's not all that long. And then we'll break it down a bit. Uh, well, come down the rabbit hole with me this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting with verse 1. These are the words of Paul to his young protege, Timothy. He says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all good, godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God... And one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. A, a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray. Lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For at, we're just at the beginning, guys. <laughs> For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But the women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with, with propriety. Okay, now I'm nervous because I thought I was going to get through that before there were any noises. Okay, so full submission. Uh, there's a trigger word for some people. Modest dress. Women no teachy. Um, <laughs> sa saved through childbearing. Ugh, we are going to be here all day. Um, I'm just kidding. Stick with me. I promise I'm going to offend both genders equally this morning. Um, <laughs> There's something in it for all of us. Um, first of all, let's start back at the beginning. It's really important to remember the thrust of this section. And sometimes you get bogged down in the weeds when you get to some of that language. When you hear words like submission, you hear, you see this thing, this very strong language um, by Paul, the whole idea of safe through childbearing. You can get bogged down in that if you forget that what Paul calls us to at the beginning is what the point is of this whole passage is. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. 
He says it more than once in this short little chapter that I, I press you or I, I push you, I entreat you. That word, that word urge, uh, the old school world, some of, word some of us might know as exhort. I exhort you. I strongly encourage that petition, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And it's important to remember that this is where Paul starts. It's a call to prayer. It's a call for us to be people of prayer. He calls them to pray for everyone with all sorts of types of prayer. He mentions things like petitions and prayers and intercession. Petitions, asking God to move on our behalf or uh, to engage in a situation that seems like it's out of our control. For God to step in and help for Yahweh to save us. For prayers and intercession, to pray for other people, to call out on their behalf, not just in our own situations, but for their needs, for their protection, for their blessing. And then thanksgiving for everyone. Thanksgiving made for all people. Now, I don't know how to heart you take every passage of scripture, but this is one of those passages of scriptures that kind of shook me a little bit. Thanksgiving for everyone? I'm okay with praying for everybody. I'm okay for praying for people that I disagree with, praying for people that they'll just figure it out and see it my way. Um, But thanksgiving for everyone? I've become increasingly hermit-like when it comes to my uh, engagement online. Um, I find Facebook uh, to be full of people just shouting at each other, calling out the idiocy of our leaders, complaining and demanding change. And and I've got some friends who are a little farther to the left in my uh, Facebook feed who are all in an uproar about what's going on in the States. And I'm like, do you live in the States? No. Like, do we really need it? No, I don't know. But everybody's just wound right up. I, I, I actually went through and I looked at my Facebook feed and I'm like, that's an ad. That's an ad. That's somebody who really doesn't like Trump. That's an ad. That's an ad. That's somebody who doesn't like Trudeau. That's an ad. And that's, that's what Facebook kind of has become. And I've, I've, I've stopped engaging. I've stopped, I've stopped posting stuff that's political. I've stopped, even though there's stuff that I would feel very strongly about, I've instead turned my heart to pray. To turn my voice away from just spouting stuff online and instead praying for my leaders. What would it look like if instead of just posting our opinion, everybody is entitled to my opinion, um, what would it look like if we ask God to move in their hearts, even those people that we disagree with, What if we ask God to to lead and direct and to bless them? Could we give thanks for leaders that we don't necessarily want to follow? That we don't agree with? Because remember when this letter was written. Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy is in Ephesus. Ephesus is a Greek city. It is not under Greek rule. It is under Roman rule. And he is asking those people to pray for the Romans. To pray for the enemy who has occupied their territory. Can you imagine if a leader said like, Hey, I want you to pray for the leaders who are now lording over you. To give thanks for them even. They wouldn't have been excited about the fact that the Romans had torn down some of their culture. The changes that were happening in their culture would not have been things they would have been all that excited about. And Paul's encouragement to them is, uprise. Take it by storm. Fight back. Nope. Pray. Petitions. Be thankful. Live at peace. Is this our go-to move? Is this the first of all that Paul, I urge you, first of all, pray. Do we petition? Do we intercede? Do we give thanks? Are we people of prayer? Or are we people of Facebook posts and angry letters? Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, encouraged something similar. He says, don't be anxious about anything. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In every situation, pray. How often do you pray? How do you pray? Are there petitions? Is there thanksgiving? Are there prayers of intercession where you're calling out on someone else's behalf? Do you pray the same time every day, the same thing every day? 
Sort of like grace before a meal. How many of you have the standard rub-a-dub-dub? Thanks for the grub. Yay, Lord. No? Nobody else? But we get kind of in these cycles of, well, I I pray when I get up and I say sort of the same thing. Uh, If you really want an exercise in humility, count how many times you say the word just in your prayers. Jesus, if you would just... Hmm. Paul calls us to pray. And he calls us to pray that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That's the, that's the why. To pray for the kings and all those in authority. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. That we might be an example to the world around us is what Paul is saying. That they might see what peace looks like because of the way we live. That they might know what godliness looks like. What it looks like to be faithful people. What holiness and goodness look like. That we might be a clearer reflection of the image of God that we've been made in. Evangelism is Paul's bread and butter. It's, it's scattered throughout all of his letters. His, his main goal for getting the church to smarten up is so that the world may know. So that people would see that it's because of the way they love each other. It's because of this king who is reigning in their lives. And it's not Caesar. It's King Jesus. He wants the church to reveal Jesus to a culture that might not understand. Because you see it in the following verses. He says, this is good. It pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. That God wants all people to be saved. God loves everyone. Like, everyone. Like, everyone. Even the politicians you would disagree with. Even the neighbor who smokes pot in his backyard and you wonder how in the world you're ever going to relate to him. God loves everyone. Everyone And God wants everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth. That Jesus loves them enough to give his life for them. And I wonder if this church had forgotten that. And I wonder if sometimes we forget it. I feel like we know that it's true that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But do we live as if that's true? I feel like sometimes we look at others with judgment and disdain and, Oh, really? Pot in the backyard? Come on, dude. Or those people that we really strongly disagree with. People who are on the opposite sides of issues. We feel like God can't use them or love them because they think or believe differently than we do. But God loves them just as much as he loves you. Pro-life, pro-choice, God loves everyone. Doesn't matter what side of the issue. I wonder if sometimes we need to open our eyes just a little wider to see God at work in the bigger picture. That he might even be working on the opposite side of the aisle or the other side of the fence in the others around us. And if we might partner with what he's doing instead of always trying to fight. Remember, the call is to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 It's a really easy verse. You could probably memorize it. You could probably memorize it right now. Pray continually. You know what? That's your... How many of you will be willing to memorize this verse this week? 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray continually. I think you could handle that one. But the second question would be, could you live that out this week? Could you live in an attitude of prayer throughout your week? Because if the first verse call to prayer wasn't clear enough, Paul continues chapter... 2 verse 80 says, Therefore I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. Men, I want you to pray, is what he says. It was so encouraging to see some of our men here last week. We had uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday the other week. We had uh, uh, a week of prayer here. And to watch um, men gather, watch men pray, some of them raising their hands, praying for the neighborhood, praying for our leadership, praying for loved ones. To call out to God that he might be the one who would move in our midst. Paul says, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. That anger or disputing goes back to the whole that the world may know, the living at peace bit. 
if, if we're constantly fighting, then why would anybody want to be a part of that? Do you realize what a miracle unity is? Like, think about, think about it for just a second. In what other space would a group this size gather on a May-long weekend on a rainy day? What, what other group would be as diverse in age, in background, in even length of time, understanding who God is in their lives? For what other reason would we get together if there wasn't Jesus? Like, think about it for a second. Where else would you find a young family bringing their newborn son to connect with, to commune with, people who range from the age of their boy into their 80s? And if Bill were here today, we'd have some maybe even in their 90s. Where else would people in their 70s sit at the same table with relative strangers in their 20s? Where, where else would you see that? Where would people from Trinidad and Montreal and South Africa and even Niverville <laughs> gather together in the same place week after week to be together? Like, now looking on the outside, you could say that there is some diversity. There's definitely diversity in age. We could be a little bit more diverse. There is a whole lot of white bread up on here. Right, Skeef? <laughs> Ski feels me. <laughs> but if we look just below the surface, beyond our pasty white skin for many of us, there are a lot of things that could divide us. There are a lot of things we could choose to dig our heels in and we could fight and I want it my way and I want to do it the way that it works best for me. So unity in the body of Christ is quite a miracle. Because we gather together in this place, we are a representation of the body of Christ. And there is one body with many parts. Each one of us having a role to play. Each one of us having our backgrounds, our stories, our passions to move the body forward. And that unity is priceless. It's a thing that Paul was encouraging Timothy to encourage within his own church. I want men to pray without anger and disputing. I want everybody to have prayers and petitions so that we can live a peaceful, quiet, godly life before a world that doesn't understand. Paul continues to call us to a life of prayer and a life of peace. And here's where we hit the deep water going into 1 Timothy 2. Everybody take a deep breath. I also want the women to dress modestly, but these are the impropriety. Adorning themselves with not a lot of red hair styles or gold or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate to the women to dress for A woman should learn of kindness and submission. I do not for a woman to teach or to assume authority over man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Eve was... You know, Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became... Women will be chased through society if they continue. Faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Amen. What a great passage of scripture. Thank you so much for coming this morning. I pray that you all have a great week. Okay, I'm kidding. I, I joke about being nervous. I'm actually not that nervous about going through this passage. The only thing that makes me nervous about this... Is there are probably women within this room who have had these verses used to silence them? And that is not Paul's intention. That is not the Lord's intention with these verses. So my only fear is that when you hear me speaking, you are hearing somebody from years ago, somebody from somewhere else. You hear an echo of that. Please try and hear these words with fresh ears this morning because I believe these passages have been grossly mishandled through our history. It's one of those things that has caused great division. It has threatened the unity of the church. In fact, entire church splits have happened over the interpretation of these passages. There are entire denominations that form around some of the issues that you find within these passages. Now, we're not going to spend a ton of time on the whole modesty thing. I think we can agree, I hope we can agree, that verses 9 and 10, Paul's issue in addressing here was that we would adorn ourselves with good deeds and not be focused on fancy jewelry. He wasn't telling ladies they couldn't braid their hair on a Sunday morning. What Paul was addressing likely had a great deal to do with the culture that they were engaged in, not putting something together. First of all, I don't know that Paul would have any clue when he was writing to Timothy that 2,000 years later, I would be pulling apart every single word that he said. 
and going like, well, I wonder what Paul meant by this. He was like, well, I was writing to Timothy, and I was telling Timothy that those ladies who are dressing a little inappropriately need to maybe modest it up a little bit. Specific ladies in that situation. Now, context is king with passages like this. And I've said it a couple of times. Remember, you're reading somebody else's mail when you're reading the Timothy letters. And this letter doesn't give us all the details about why Paul would be saying some of these things. But we do know quite a bit about the socio-political and spiritual climate in Ephesus at the time of Paul's writing. From outside sources beyond scripture, but also within scripture. So we get some clues as to why Paul might be writing some of these things. First of all, this is where history gets a little interesting. Ephesus, one of the wealthiest cities in the Mediterranean world. It was an important commercial port. It was a center of learning. If you go back in Greek history, many of the great Greek philosophers either taught or were born in the city of Ephesus. It was famous for its uh, culture, its art, its... um, the, the many gods that they worshipped. Uh, it was most famous, though, for the Temple of Artemis. And the Temple of Artemis was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. It was the largest structure in Ephesus. And the cult of Artemis, the, the ones who would gather in that temple to worship, they based their worship on this Greek goddess Artemis. But the Ephesians had kind of twisted what this Greek goddess Artemis was all about. She was kind of a lesser goddess in the whole pantheon, like you know the Zeuses and the Apollos and all those. She was maybe a little farther down. But, but they had re- raised her up to be sort of the goddess of the city. That, that the reason why this place was prosperous was because Artemis was on their side, this great goddess. She was considered a savior of sorts. She was the reason for their, for their prosperity. She was a virgin. Uh, unlike Corinth, Corinth, where Corinth had uh, temple worship, where there was all kinds of prostitution and lewd behavior, and uh, their worship was all tangled up with, um, with kind of lasciviousness and like, ne- like lewd living, the, the temple of Artemis was actually the exact opposite. People they, sex was off limits. So if you followed in the cult of Artemis, you were likely a virgin all of your life. If you were a man and you wanted to follow in the temple of Artemis, uh, you probably became a eunuch in order to follow in this cult. All of the leaders in the temple of Artemis were female. It was an all-female cult led by the ladies where they ruled over the men. And this was the main religion in the city when Timothy's planting his little church. Now, if you think that that's just all speculation and coming from Greek understanding, come with me to Acts chapter 19. So this is from our own scripture. Acts chapter 19, verse 23, it says, About that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. That's the gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together along with the workers and related trades and says, You know, my friends, we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only to our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, and the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. And what follows for the rest of the chapter in in Acts chapter 19 is basically a riot that happens in Ephesus. The, The men start shouting like, great is Artemis! And Paul and his companions are kind of like caught up in this citywide riot that ends up in the middle of the town square where they're basically saying that Paul and his guys have got to go because Artemis is queen over this city. Paul would have been keenly aware of the religion and the impact it would have had in a fledgling church in Ephesus. And if that's the influence going on in the background... Do these verses make a little bit more sense? A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I don't permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. See, sometimes Paul gets a bad rap. 
Because people have labeled him a misogynist because of these verses. They've said, like, clearly it's, like, it's, it's patriarchal. It's only the men who are allowed to lead and that they lord it over their wives. But you don't have to look very far into Paul's teaching or actually any of the Gospels into Jesus' teaching to realize that men and women are not set in one of these sort of positions. There's a level playing field. In Galatians 3.28, he says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. If if you go back to Jesus, Mary and Martha, they were clearly disciples of Jesus. Mary sat at Jesus' feet. And when Jesus said she's chosen the better, like to not just fuss and worry in the kitchen, he was saying it's good that she's learning. It's good that she is taking this all in because she's going to pass this on to other people. Who were the first to witness the resurrection? Who were the first to tell the good news? Women. You can go through the New Testament. Tabitha, Priscilla, Phoebe, Lydia, leaders in the church, Junia, referred to as an apostle. So often in his letters, Paul would close with greetings to these female leaders. And sometimes in trying to keep our uh, handle on what Paul was saying in uh, Timothy in First Timothy two here, we've tried to say like, well, Junia, that's probably just a dude's name. Like they weren't really leaders. They they weren't over top of because they're not allowed to have authority over. It, it's interesting. It's 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 revolutionary that the women were even allowed to learn based on Jewish history to even be in the presence of a leader like Jesus, never mind being told she's chosen what's better. So you may look at the words of Paul and just be like, well, Paul, come on, like, Jesus was for women learning. Why why are you shutting the women down? But if in Ephesus, things have been flipped out of balance the other way, where women were lording it over the men and there wasn't equality... What would Paul want to say in a situation like that? These passages weren't some blanket statement for all churches for all time. Paul was writing to a specific pastor of a specific church in a specific time with some pretty specific issues. And remember, we're reading somebody else's mail. But if you do still see a dichotomy between what Paul says about men and what he says about women, let's do some math. How much does he call out the men to pray And how much does he shut the women down? Because sometimes I feel like we fall prey to the last part of the verse and we forget that the first part was a call to prayer. The first part of um, of the letter, he actually says that we get caught up in useless genealogies and myths. We've wandered away from the main thing into meaningless talk. And I think sometimes when we get hooked on some of these passages and we want to hold really tightly to them, we miss what God might have actually been trying to get across. That he was calling us to be people who would pray and live in peace. Reminding us that God wants all people to come to faith, men and women. That we need to remove barriers for people and Some of those barriers apparently would have been anger and disputing for the men. Some of those would have been fighting and arguing. And in Timothy's case, it might have been immodesty and flashy dress. It might have been that the women looked just like the culture around it, trying to lower their newfound freedom over the men in the church. And Tim, or Paul says to Timothy, this isn't, this isn't the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom is equality. The way of the kingdom is we learn together. We don't lord it over one another. Now, there are some who say that the women just didn't know, so they needed to sit and learn before they were able to teach. But I think Paul was getting at this idea of living as one body. And to remove the barriers for the world around them. So a barrier to the world around them would have been seeing the women lording over the men. What would have been the difference between the cult of Artemis and this new cult of Jesus? Now they're equal? The men don't have to emasculate themselves. They're supposed to raise their hands and pray. They're supposed to call out and pray over and intercede. Where, where women are not the ones teaching? What, what is this new balance that's being put in place? The 
world around would have looked and said, like, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't make sense. This is so different. But Paul was encouraging them to remove some of those stumbling blocks, those things that would cause people to not be curious about what this gospel was all about. What is it for us? What are our stumbling blocks? Maybe it's not women teaching. Maybe it's not immodest dress. What are the things that turn people off the gospel with the church today? Are we clothing ourselves with good deeds? Do people recognize us as people who love and who live at peace? It's, it'd be a good exercise, a, a question worth asking ourselves. Where do I fail to represent Jesus well? Where do I fall short of letting my neighbor know that they are loved beyond all understanding? How am I drawing people closer to Jesus? What am I doing that might turn them away or might become a stumbling block for them? Hmm. Okay, let's tackle the last couple of verses here. Paul goes back to the story in the beginning. He says, For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was a woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay. Keep the context in mind. Remember the call was to pray. What's going on in the world around them? Artemis, Savior, Virgin. Keep the idea of learning and lord it over other people in your mind. Adam was formed first. Then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. Now, this doesn't remove the blame from Adam. Uh, one of my favorite uh, parts of scripture is when uh, Adam gets caught. And God says like, well, how did you know you were naked? And he's like, uh, the woman that you gave me. So, like, no blame. Adam takes no responsibility for the fact that he ate the fruit. Uh, no, that woman, but, but that you gave me. So it's her fault and your fault, but it's not my fault. That's not what's going on here. This is a leveling of the playing field again. The claim here is, what, is that Eve was able to be drawn astray because she didn't hear the words directly from the Lord. It was Adam who failed. It was Adam who failed Eve. It was Adam who failed God. He ate knowing exactly what the score was. So Adam was formed first, then Eve. But it was Adam who wasn't deceived. It's this, let's, the women don't get to be over, but men are also, we suck too. Um, we're all on living play, level playing field before the cross. And then he ends with this, Ah, borderline ridiculous verse. Ridiculous only because we don't, I don't know where he was going with this, right? Women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Okay. Does this mean if you are female and you have never delivered a child, you are not saved? Because if you take a very literal reading of trans, uh, translation or reading of scripture, it seems pretty clear this is what Paul is saying. Women will be saved through childbearing. Have babies, get saved, continue in faith, love and holiness. No, that's not what Paul is saying. He can't, he can't be saying that you have to have a child in order to be saved. We need to understand a couple of things. First, remember the context. Remember the verses that came before it. Remember what's going on in the city that he's writing. He said they'll be saved through childbearing. This is one of those interesting literary moves that Paul makes every once in a while where we don't pick up on the hints um, because we don't have a Jewish mind. We don't pick up on what he's hearkening back to. But we do get a clue in the verses before. He's talking about Adam and Eve, and then he says we'll be saved through childbearing. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. 
So, in Ephesus, Artemis was the savior. She was the one who, she was a virgin, so she watched over women who gave birth. And often women would cry out to Artemis to help them when they would go through delivery. Well, it's not Artemis who saves. It's Jesus who saves. And this offspring, this childbearing, was a hint at it's Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the one who is going to save us if we put our trust in him. But there's a, there's a double sort of thing that he does here because it's also, it's a re- recognition that the curse is going to be reversed, that Jesus is going to step in and he is going to save us. But it's also a, a reminder for them not to follow in the ways of the temple goddesses and to look down on sex and childbirth, that, that this is a, a beautiful thing that God has instituted, that Virginity had become a mark of spirituality in the cult of Artemis. And Paul was saying that children could be a blessing as well. So to not look down on those women who had gotten married and had children, that they were somehow lesser people because they had not stayed pure the way those in the temple of Artemis had. Paul was saying that this could be an incredible blessing, that this childbearing idea was about Jesus, but it was also about, let's not fall into what the culture declares needs to be the way that we follow God. So I hope that clears up a little bit of the childbearing salvation issue for some of us. Paul was calling out the men, and we might think that he was shutting down the women, but he wasn't doing it in the ways that it's been interpreted in recent years. The idea of women not being allowed to teach, not being ordained in ministry, that's only maybe 150, 200 years old. Many of the first churches were planted by women. Timothy himself probably wouldn't have come to faith had he not had his mom and his grandma teaching him scripture, showing him what it was to follow in the ways of God. Paul was calling all of us. He was calling both halves of the sky. He was calling us all to pray. He was calling us to remove barriers that would keep people from seeing Jesus. He was calling all of us to live lives of modesty and purity. To not be so caught up in the culture around us that we look and sound just like everyone else. So yes, he did call out the men. And he called them to pray. And I think sometimes when we focused on these verses, we get pretty uh, self-righteous and like, yeah, ladies are supposed to be quiet. Uh, Did you hear the part where you're supposed to pray, dudes? So if they're silent, then there better be a whole lot of mouth stuff coming from you that's prayer. But he calls all of us. He calls all of us to be people of prayer. He calls us to lift up holy hands. Men, he's calling us to lift up our holy hands and to pray without anger or disputing. He's calling us to lead. He's calling us to be men who are passionate followers of Jesus. And in this instance, he's asking the ladies to just not be teaching, to not be, not be lording over the men, not being just like the cult of Artemis but to recognize that we are, we are on level ground before the cross. And, and I would say that we've, we've sometimes, we've seen that fluctuate back and forth within the church where sometimes it's healthy and sometimes it's not. I think sometimes we need to call out the men a little bit more, calling us to pray, calling us to lead. Often women end up leading in the church not because they feel passionate about it or they feel like this is their place, They do it because men aren't willing to step up and do the work. Oh, we're too busy. Oh, that's not my thing. Can you pray about it? And find out what is your thing, men? I told you I'd offend you equally this morning. (laughs) Because he calls us to pray. He calls us to be passionate followers of Jesus. Not just men not just women. It's not about calling out the men and shutting down the women. It's about bringing us to a place where the church reveals Jesus really, really well. 
So I want us as men to pray. I want us to pray for our church, its leadership, its youth, its kids, its women. I want us to pray for our neighborhoods, our co-workers, our family and friends. I want us to be men of prayer. But I also want us to be women of prayer. Well, not us, but you guys to be women of prayer. I want to call you to lead and to learn. I want, if you've been silenced by this verse in the past, I just, I want these words to set you free. If you've been kept down because somebody has twisted these verses to say that you're just not gifted, you're not allowed to teach, you're not allowed to have authority over a man, so therefore you don't get to share this stage if God's laid something on your heart. I have a number of friends in, and colleagues in ministry who are women who their perspective on scripture, their perspective on the heart of God has challenged me as a man in a way that another guy couldn't because of the way they see things. I pray that we would find a new way forward, that we wouldn't hold on to specific ideologies, but we would look for what is the way of the kingdom, that men and women are free as sons and daughters of the king, that I am because you are. It's, a, it's an African understanding of the way we are, the body of Christ. It's called Ubuntu, and it means that I am only because you are. And if I am not healthy, you are not healthy. If you are not free and whole, then I am not free and whole. Women, you are the other half of the sky. You bear the image of God in ways that men simply cannot. We need your voice, we need your vision, we need your passion. We need to see and hear Jesus through you. Men, you are the other half of the sky. We need your voice, we need your vision, we need your passion. We need to see and hear Jesus through you. Not one over the other, not one better, together. So all of us adorn ourselves with good deeds and follow Jesus with all our heart. We need every believer to fulfill their destiny as image bearers. I need men to step up and follow Jesus with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I need women to step up and follow Jesus with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because we need each other. Ubuntu. I am because you are. Are. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for I thank you for your word. And I thank you that it's been preserved for so many centuries that we today in 2017 on a May long weekend can sit down and pour over words of encouragement that an apostle who uh, who had his heart turned towards you and planted some of the first churches who was there at the the beginning of the spread of the good news. We could read his words to this young pastor and and try and figure out what it means for our own lives. I I sometimes wish we had a time machine. I wish we could we could go back and we could sit down while Paul was writing and say like wait 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 wait. In about two thousand years People are going to read this passage and they're going to be scratching their heads trying to figure out what you're getting at. Could you just add a few more details? We realize we don't get that. We don't get that option this morning and so we we trust that your spirit will continue to lead us into all truth. That as we ask questions, as we seek as men and as women to serve humbly, to approach your word with a a passion to know you more and to see our brothers and sisters set free, to see those people who are outside of our community question, what is this love? What is this peace? What is this about this unity that would cause people to gather together on a long weekend? Lord, help us to remove barriers in our own lives. Help us to wrestle with those passages of scripture like this that sometimes we'd rather just avoid and skip over to a parable. Help us to look at your word and see how it shapes and changes us. And Lord, may we, as men, lift up holy hands and pray. Would you cause us to be uh, people who are um, willing to humble ourselves and get on our knees and to call out to you to admit that we don't always have the answer, that we don't always have the strength but that you do and that we trust in you 
Help us to, to serve the other half of the body, the ladies in our life, with dignity and honor and respect. Help us to be men who call out the best in them and encourage them to be all that you've called them to be. And for the ladies in our community, may they know the freedom of being a daughter of the king. May they know the freedom of being called to be servants of yours. May they find their place. May they find their voice. And may we as men be richer for it. May the church rise up, everybody at work, pouring all of their time, effort, and energy into your kingdom that we might see people come to know you. So Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your people. Would you send us from this place with your blessing, with your encouragement, and with your peace, we pray. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, we made it. Dave and I were joking beforehand. I should have hid behind the um, plastic shield that just set it up here and preached behind it. But we did okay. We did okay. Um, Have a great rest of your long weekend. I think the rain has stopped. Um, And so enjoy the rest of your long weekend. We will see you guys next week.